Good afternoon, everyone. Hope you had a good weekend. Uh, we're going to start a new unit today. Um, before I start, are there any questions about the midterm exam coming up on Friday? Everybody good with that? Um, question? Or? Could I ask a question about the unit five we posted? Um, sure. Uh, could you explain a little bit about the uh, area under the curve? Area under the curve? Sure. Um, Okay, so, so to back up a little bit, um, let's see. So when we first started talking about uh, logistic regression or, or binary linear regression, we talked about computing this score Z and then thresholding it at zero. And, and that is not the only option. Um, sometimes you might want to threshold that score or Z at some other value. And one way to think about it is to think about the, um, <clears throat> this probability model that we get from the um, logistic regression. And we can, so, so here we're saying you can threshold that. So thresholding this at some t is equivalent to thresholding this at some other warped value. Okay, <clears throat> and what you see when you change that threshold that is your decision region, um, you, you kind of get different properties and depends what property you're looking for. So if you want to minimize the error rate, then setting t equals 0.5, which corresponds to z equals zero, is exactly what we want to do. But if you say, well, I have um, a situation where maybe one kind of error is much more important than another kind of error, uh, the classification or the, the error rate or accuracy is not really important. And so then you might say, I care um, about precision or I care about recall. Sometimes maybe you're designing something and then there's constraints in the application that say you must have precision that is at least this or a recall that's at least this. And so what you can then do is you can study your classifier and you, look at, you can look at precision and recall curves and you can notice, oh, you know, my precision um, hits 90% at this value of t. <clears throat> so now I know that that is the, the value of t in order to get that design constraint. Okay, so, um, so that's sort of like a, a general idea now is that once we don't, once, once we recognize that we have alternatives for the threshold that's not just set z equals zero, then the design space becomes larger and it allows us to do more things, but it also sort of complicates our design because, um, for example, with precision and recall, um, if you only look at, at one or the other, then you want to, you know, take your threshold all the way to, to one or all the way to zero. Like it, it's, it's not enough to look at one or the other. You really need to look at them jointly, and then it becomes challenging because you have like two different things you're trying to optimize simultaneously. Um, and <clears throat> the other thing too is, is that sometimes the particular value of the threshold that you want is something that you only know uh, maybe before you start optimizing your classifier. So you wanna optimize your classifier, let's say for different thresholds, not just for one particular threshold. And that's where we finally get to this um, ROC curve and area under the curve. <clears throat> so, so there's different ways to make these kind of trade-off curves. This particular one is when you're looking at true positive rate on one axis and false positive rate on the other axis. And here are the curves that show you how those things change as a function of threshold. <clears throat> so as you change your threshold, you move from like a pair, you know, there to the pair there to a pair there and so on. And, um, and if you want to plot those things simultaneously in two dimensions, as you change your threshold, you trace out this curve. I think, I think increasing T is this way from what I remember. So, so here you can see, you know, as you change that threshold, you have like a whole range of combinations as what you, what you can get with these. And if you, um, if you know, like, you are really interested in a particular false positive rate, 
you know, that's great. You know that you want to be there on the curve. But if you're not really sure, and, and maybe you're gonna, you want to decide that later, not right now, what area under the curve um, is, is it's sort of a, a generic way that says, okay, in general, I want to be, I want to be in this direction. I want to have high true positive rate. I want to have small fa false positive rate. So the best place to be, like the ideal classifier would be right here. Now, uh, I can't get all the way there with this classifier. Like I, I can work along this frontier and, um, and, and I can achieve any of these points, but you know, I don't really know which one is, is good. So why don't I just look at the area under the curve, which is just the area under there. And that's sort of like an overall metric of goodness that is gonna take into consideration a whole range of different possible thresholds. So, so this is, um, so this is a, a very popular thing to do when, number one, you don't care about accuracy, you care about things like these or precision and recall. You can also make a precision and recall type curve. There's different ways to make this. Once you have that curve, um, you essentially wish that this had unit area because this is like size one and one. So you wish it had, well, actually, okay, this thing can go all the way to one. I didn't plot it here, but you wish this thing had an area of one. In practice, it's gonna have an area less than one, but that could be your design criteria. And that is a very popular design criteria when you don't care about accuracy, but you can't, you don't know exactly what threshold you wanna use. <laughs> so long answer to your question, but does that? Sorry, just a quick follow up. Um, yeah. So, I mean, if you maximize uh, area under the curve, wouldn't that be setting the false positive rate really high? Um, Wouldn't that be setting one? So, okay, so, so, if, so this is the ideal curve, which, um, which means that, like, as you change your threshold, you instantly go from, you basically instantly jump up to here, which has smallest false positive rate and largest true positive rate. Right? That would be, that'd be the optimal curve. So it's like, um, and, and this is sort of like, you, basically like you, you start here and you go here. And so I'm just, I'm just kind of like making a dashed line here to, to show you that like, I mean, okay, let, let, let's say I had something that was just a tiny bit worse than the perfect classifier. So I would be just a little bit to the right there. So I would have a line that would be not quite infinite slope, but it'd go up very quickly. And so like my false positive rate, as that went up a tiny bit from zero, my true positive rate would go all the way up to one. And that would be the best possible thing, right? And then, so now, yes, if I kept changing my threshold, I would stay at that same true positive rate. My false positive rate would get worse, but you know, that's probably, I probably don't wanna work over here if I can be all the way over here. But still, that would be the full curve. And this full curve would have that full area of one. That would be the optimum thing. <clears throat> okay, so that's, uh, is that making sense? Okay. All right. Any other questions on anything from Unit 5? Okay, sorry I missed uh, lecture last Friday. <clears throat> okay, great. So, um, and then you said no questions on the midterm? Excellent, so we are um, ready to start a new unit. Um, by the way, I, I can post the, the homework and lab for unit five as soon as you guys want. I just haven't done so because I didn't want to distract you from the midterm coming up. How many people wish that I would post it soon so you could start working on it? Okay, I'll, I'll do that. I'll post it, but yeah. It won't be due until Friday in a week. So like almost two weeks from now. Yeah, so we have a little bit of a lag now between the lecture and when things are due, but, but that lag will, will catch up. So it's just how it works. That's good. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I the, uh, are you going to make a unit here or the unit one quiz available to you? I think that one's still locked. Oh, um, so unit zero? Yeah. Um, oh, for some reason, I thought, oh, okay. For some reason, I thought you could see all the answers, but you're saying you can't, you can't yeah, see them all. Okay. Sorry about that. I will, I'll try to fix that. 
If you could, someone could send me an email, that'd be a great reminder. Okay, I think all the other quizzes should be now posted, and I think all but one of the homeworks is graded, and the, the grader is working hard, and he should hopefully have that graded soon. Okay, very good. So, um, okay, so in this unit, this unit sort of builds on the previous one. Um, in the previous unit, we talked about logistic regression, and we saw that we had a design problem um, to design our <coughs> vector of coefficients, W, that we, form, we formulated as an optimization problem that looked like this. So we had natural log of 1 plus E to the ZI, and then we had minus YI ZI. All of that was summed. And finally, the, these W coefficients come into play here. So as a slight um, notational simplification, instead of having a separate intercept coefficient b, I'm just going to write b as w0. And then that way, I can add it to the front of the w vector. And then I pad the features with a 1, similar to how we made that a matrix. And so now I can just minimize over those w coefficients, which includes the intercept. Okay, so this is what we said we would like to do to solve this problem, but this is a problem that is too complicated to um, solve analytically on paper and get a solution, be able to write it down. So we said basically we have to rely on some algorithmic approaches. Uh, they're built into scikit-learn, which is great, but our objective in this unit is to understand how those are working because that's a huge part of machine learning is, is the optimization part of it. Um, so, so our goal is to be able to solve this optimization problem ourselves and to learn about a whole bunch of tools uh, involved in doing so that are going to be very useful as we, as we move forward in the course. <clears throat> so that's the objective. Um, all right, any questions on motivation? OK. So we're, we're now going to come back and talk about gradients. We've talked about gradients a few times, so hopefully um, they are getting more and more familiar to you. But we're going to expand our discussion a little bit today. So our objective, the way we're going to write it, is we're going to have argmin of some, some function j, <clears throat> which sometimes we call it a cost, sometimes we call it a loss. Those terms are interchangeable. That is the thing we're trying to minimize. So in the previous, on the previous page, you know, that would be this thing. That would be our J. Um, in practice, we might also want to add a ridge regression penalty to this, but let's not worry about that at the moment. Um, so this is our objective. And so <clears throat> the way we had um, attacked this problem back in units one and two, where we had a simpler loss that was quadratic, is we said, let's find the gradient. Let's like derive the gradient as an expression. Let's set it to 0, and then try to solve for the w hat, the coefficients that make that gradient 0. And we could do that in the quadratic case, units 1 and 2. We can't do that anymore, but it's still going to be a really useful idea and tool that we're going to use algorithmically in, in this approach we're going to describe. So, so the gradient has a few important properties. Um, first of all, we know that at the minimizer, the gradient equals 0. That was the main property that we used before. Um, we also talked about how if you look at the gradient at any point w, at any vector w, you can get the direction of maximum increase of that cost j, as well as the slope, like how much it is increasing. Not only what direction to travel in, but how steep is it. Um, <clears throat> so one thing that we haven't spent too much time on 
is asking when does this gradient actually exist? So it exists if this cost function is differentiable in or differentiable in the W parameters, you know, at all locations. Um, we're going to keep assuming that this is the case throughout most of this unit, although at the end I'll, I'll talk about a little bit about um, cases where it's not. So just imagine that we always can take this derivative. We can always compute the gradient. We don't have to worry about not being able to compute it. And then we've seen pictures like this, which is showing, let's say, in one direction, maybe you have W0. Another direction, you have W1. And you have um, a peak here. Th these are contours. Uh, this is like a top topographic map. So you have a peak over here. You have a, a valley here, and these arrows show the, the gradient, its direction as well as its magnitude. So the longer the arrow, the, the larger the gradient magnitude, which means steeper. So, um, so if you want to go from that valley up to this hill, the fastest way to go if you start here is directly uphill, and you can see it gets steep right over there in the middle. If, however, you're over here, actually the fastest way is to kind of go like that, a little bit roundabout if you follow the gradients that way. Um, if you're over here and you want to go steep uphill, you end up going this way. Okay, so that's how, the, how to read that plot. Okay, any question about gradients? Okay, so, um, <clears throat> so now what we're going to do to generalize this idea is we're going to realize that gradients can be computed on more than vectors. You can compute them um, on matrices as well. And that's going to be really important for us, especially later. So let's first come back to the definition of the gradient. We've seen this before, but if we have um, this cost that is, that the input is a vector, vector valued, then the, um, the gradient, we have these partial derivatives, dj, d, let's see, so I'll start with, I'll start counting at one here. So the first one is djw, dw1, then dw2, and so we then have all the partial derivatives up to the last one, dwd. So this is if w is a real number um, it is, is a vector in d-dimensional real space. <clears throat> it's important that, the, um, that this function is scalar output. Okay, so the cost just has one value. It's not like there's, the cost is multi-valued. That would break everything. So what we're talking about here is changing the size of the input. The output is always size one. So that's what we've seen before. So now it turns out that if we have uh, matrix value parameters, which we saw once in the context of um, multinomial logistic regression, where we had every column of W was the, were the weights for a different class. So in that case, you know, we want to optimize that whole matrix. We can still do that with gradient methods. It's now we're going to have a matrix of values. So the top left corner will be DJ w over dw11 and then as we go across the columns in this first row we have dw1 to k and as we go down we get djw oops partial respect to w d1 and as we go across to this corner, dj, w, dw, d, k. It's capital K. <clears throat> okay, so here we have an entire matrix. But the idea is the same in both cases. You just look at all the partial derivatives that you can compute with respect to the input. And you organize them in a shape which has exactly the same shape as the input. So if the input here is a column vector, 
the gradient is a column vector of exactly the same length. If the input is a matrix, the gradient is a matrix of exactly the same dimensions. Okay, so the point is that the gradient always has exactly the same dimensions as the input. Eventually, we will have tensors where this is not a matrix but some structure that has three or more dimensions, and the idea extends directly to that as well. You just have all these different partial derivatives. Okay. All right. Is this making sense? Any questions? Okay. All right. So, um, so let's just do a couple simple examples. All right. So I can ask some attendance questions. So here we have a, um, a cost, just a simple cost. We have parameters W1 and W2. They come together in the cost this way. So to compute the gradient vector, we need to compute the partial derivatives. So let's see, is, um, is Michael Otterman here? Yeah. Okay. So how do we, how do we write that first partial derivative? Two W one, uh huh. Plus uh, two W one minus one two. Right, great. Okay, and let's see. Is um, Victoria Smith? Yeah. So how do we do the next one then? Okay, great. And um, <clears throat> so then, how do we put these together? In a gradient is uh, Sean Yen. Okay, what about Brandon Young? Exactly. Okay, so as simple as that. Um, so the code on the right computes both the cost as well as a gradient, because usually, as we'll see, when you compute one, you want to compute, when you, want, when you compute the gradient, you also want to compute the cost to keep track of how well you have optimized that function. Um, and so here, th this, this function here takes in the W vector. It you know, extracts the, the two values. It involves them to create this. Then it computes the gradient. So it computes first this part, then this part, and then it makes a NumPy array out of those two values. And then it returns both of them. And so to test this out, we first come up with sort of an arbitrary um, W vector that has the numbers 2 and 4 in it. We plug those into this function. And we assign the values to J and J grad. Then we print them. And you can see J is a scalar, as we expect. And J grad is a, a vector. Um, two-dimensional vector as we expect. <clears throat> okay, so that's relatively simple. Any questions on this? Okay, let's move to a more complicated example that looks more like what we will tend to see for machine learning. So here, we have a cost function that is the sum over some training samples. Here we have our target's yi, and here we have a model of that, of the target, which as you can see, is no longer a linear model. It's actually an exponential model controlled by two parameters. One is a, a scalar that's inside the exponent b. Another one is a scalar that's outside the exponent a. So you can imagine that you know, this is just, we haven't done this yet, but it's something you can imagine doing, fitting an exponential model to data. This is the RSS of the predictions. Uh, so now our objective would be to find the a and the b that minimize the RSS. So, you know, how, do, how we do this, that's what we're learning about in this unit. But the first step, or the, the kind of main tool we'll be using, is to compute the gradient of this function at a given vector w. And so the first step to that is to compute these partial derivatives here and here. <clears throat> so let's see, is, um, is Levi Waldron here? OK. so. Gave you a slightly harder one. Can you see how we can do the first part? So 
So, okay, so the overall technique is going to be the chain rule. That's how we approach these complicated partial derivatives. Um, so we're interested in the gradient with respect or the derivative with respect to this value here. So what we're going to do is we're going to, you know, take this partial dj dA of this. So remember that by linearity, we can move that through the sum. So we're going to get 1 half times the sum. And then we're going to take the partial derivative of this with respect to a, right? So that's easier. Don't have the sum to deal with. So by the chain rule, it's going to be 2 times this times the partial derivative of this thing with respect to a. Okay, so when we do the 2, that comes out on top, cancels the other 2, and then we have the thing inside the parentheses. And then we have the partial derivative of this with respect to a. <clears throat> and so that gives us minus e to the power of minus bxi. Okay, so not, it's not so bad once you like break it down into these steps. Okay, any questions? On that, so we can, if we like, we could simplify this by removing that fraction. Okay. Um, all right. Good. So let's move on to the to the next one, which is a little bit harder. Um, so is uh, let's see, Kian Kao, Q I A N C A O. Yeah. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing it. Um, so how do we do this next part? Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, so this, this comes down, and we'll put the 2 over here. Then we'll have the same thing, right? Okay, so then the last step is partial of this respect to B. So this has no role. So what about this? partial of this with respect to B. Remember how you do that? So you gotta, so if you have the partial of, a, of an exponential, you get that whole exp exponential times the derivative of what's in the exponent. So we're gonna get minus A, that whole exponential, and then we're finally gonna have the derivative of this with respect to B which is minus xi, right? So that minus is going to kill this, and then we're just going to have xi there. Okay, and we can get rid of this as well. Okay, so you'll, you'll do a lot of this stuff, so um, you'll, you'll get a lot of practice. <clears throat> okay, so finally, um, we can stack these things um, into a column vector. Um, I moved the A to the front here just to emphasize that it didn't really depend on uh, the sum. And now we want a piece of code that does this efficiently. We don't want to um, do computations and repeat them unnecessarily because in machine learning, um, Often the data sets get really big. Um, often you have to do lots and lots of iterative optimization steps. And as a result, things really slow down if your implementation is not efficient. So this code is trying to really save everywhere it can by pre-computing little things that can be used over and over again. For example, notice that this thing appears down here. Okay, so I, that, that suggests we should try to compute this and store it, and then we can use it twice once that's done. So, okay, so this is what happens. So we, you know, we take in x, y, and w. It's also important here to point out that um, x and y are going to be vectors containing all these different training samples. So we unpack the w vector into a and b, and then the first thing we do is we compute this and store it as c. To compute that, we have NumPy exponential, 
minus b times x. Notice that we are um, plugging in that entire x vector here, and we're using what's called NumPy broadcasting. So NumPy broadcasting is something we're going to uh, talk about a bunch in this unit. Um, it's basically NumPy's way to extend scalar type operations to vectors and matrices according to some sensible rules. So for example, some of these rules are, are just, you know, exactly what you would expect. If you have um, b as a scalar and x as a vector, then it makes sense that you can multiply a scalar times a vector, right? And what that means is you're going to multiply b times every element in the vector x. So that's, that's what's done here. Now, NumPy is also smart enough to know that if you want to exponentiate a vector, that just means you want to exponentiate every element in the vector, and that is what's returned here. So C is really a vector of those guys for all the different i's. <clears throat> okay, so now that we've computed C, um, we can compute, uh, we can also compute this term, which is, it's called Y error, because it's like the, um, actually, we're going to compute this whole thing, which is like the error on Y. So we're going to take that Y vector, and now minus A times that C vector. Okay, so now y error is a column or is a vector. And finally, we can compute this by taking this y error and doing a pointwise multiply times this vector c and then summing the result. So this this is important here. This is a pointwise. So that's, that's an important concept because when you, write, when you write things, you have to follow the rules of linear algebra. When you code things, you can take advantage of shortcuts and tricks in the code to do things that are generally illegal otherwise. So in this case, what I'm saying is if on a test you had the C vector and you had um, the Y error, I'll just call that E, and you wrote C times E, I would say, wrong, you can't do that because here you have, you have one thing that is a column vector, you have another thing that's a column vector, you're not allowed to multiply those according to the rules of linear algebra. Okay. So what's being done here is, is a different sort of operation that is not a standard matrix matrix multiply, it's a pointwise thing. Um, you can actually write this down, officially it's called the Hadamard product. And when you write it down, you use a dot with a circle. Um, and this means the element-wise product between two vectors. That will give you another vector of the same size. So that is exactly what's happening in this operation here. So, it's, so yeah, when you code, you want to take advantage of NumPy broadcasting to do these things. You never want to use for loops in your code um, unless they're unavoidable or unless that for loop only has to run a few times. You would never want to, you know, code this with a for loop over i. That would be extremely slow. Because the compiler, most of these compilers are not good enough to compile that down to something that runs quickly. Uh, so by, by writing it in terms of linear algebra, you're kind of helping the compiler out to say, um, this is something that you can do very fast once, once you're given the task of multiplying two vectors. It knows how to do that, super optimized for whatever architecture it's running. Okay, so that's, that's sort of what's, what's happening here. And then um, you can see that we're going to reuse all those same things here for this. Um, this is like a chain of those Hadamard products and so on. Okay, is this, uh, is this making sense? All right. Um, and then... <clears throat> Yeah, so then just to demonstrate it, we're going to um, say how many, you know, n's going to be 100. We'll just make some random vectors of, for y and x using a random number generator. We'll just sort of arbitrarily set w at the values 1 and 2, and then we will evaluate the cost and gradient and print out the values. And they seem to be, you know, very large numbers, but that's just based on how we made the data and the parameters we chose. Right, so this is um, just another example of computing the cost and gradient. Everybody good with this? 
Okay, great. All right, so a really important um, idea for us that we're going to use a whole bunch of different ways is the idea of first order approximation. And we're going to do this several times with increasing complexity. So on this page, we're going to do with scalar input functions, the next page, vector input functions, the next page, matrix input functions. So we're going to start simple, but the ideas are going to be very similar. Um, so the idea behind uh, first order approximation can be seen here, but we, let's just look at this before we write out any math. So this is saying if you have some generic nonlinear function j, in this case, it's just a function of a scalar input, w, and you want to look at a particular value, let's say we're going to call it w0, that's like a reference value, and you want to say, how, you know, can I approximate my function, my nonlinear function, in the neighborhood around uh, w0? In this case, if it's differentiable, that means that when you're really close to w0, the blue function looks like a line. It's, it's pretty close to a line when you're close to w0. Of course, as you go away from w0, you can see it's very far from a line. It gets curved. But we're saying, we're, what we're saying is, if you stay close to w0, you can use a linear approximation, and that's going to make your life easier in various ways, um, computationally, conceptually, various ideas. And also, this first order, th this, uh, this linear approximation is very um, tightly connected to gradients as well, because you use the gradient, or essentially, the, the, the whole idea here is that this approximation matches the curve in both its value at this point as well as the slope at that point. It's matching those two things, and that's all it's matching. It's not matching any nonlinear curvature because our approximation is linear. Okay, so those are sort of the ideas. Um, if we want to write this in terms of math, we do this using... Taylor series. So we say that the Taylor series of this function at this reference point w naught can be written. Um, so this is so I'm writing something now which is for a, a generic w, not to be confused with my reference. So what we have is we have we have the function <coughs> evaluated at the reference point plus we have the slope of the function evaluated at that reference point times the deviation from the reference plus what's called a big O term, which I'll describe in a moment, which collects all the other complicated stuff about J that is not described by this, these first two terms in the Taylor series. So if we, if we wanted to, we could, we could, instead of writing this, we could write the second order term, which would have a second derivative and would involve a square of that. We could have the third order term, which would involve you know, higher order derivatives and so on and so on. You could go as far as you like out to infinity. But we're saying we're, we're just going to stop here and write all those other terms in the Taylor series. We're going to summarize it by this big O term. How many people have heard of the, the big O or have seen it? Okay, the big O is basically, it's just a gross approximation that is trying to capture the size of this term. Say, basically, how big is it? And if you see a phrase like something equals big O of epsilon squared, <clears throat> that means that whatever function you're saying is big O is at most a constant times epsilon squared when epsilon is close to zero. So it's sort of a mouthful, but that's essentially, you're saying that all those other terms in the Taylor series approximation can be thought of as at most some constant times this, at least when this uh, w is close enough to w0. Okay, so if you want to write it in terms of the full mathematical statement, um, which is something you would see in a course on... Um, on real analysis, for example, you would say that a function g of epsilon is order epsilon squared, big O epsilon squared. What that means is that there exists some positive constants 
c and delta such that this quadratic upper bound holds for all epsilon whose radius is between 0 and delta. So again, it's even more of a mouthful, but at least it's, it's very precise. So you can see kind of focuses on this upper bound. So the details of this we don't know. We don't know what C is. There just exists, there exists some positive C under which this is true. And this is only true for a limited range of epsilon. The epsilons that are between, whose radius is between zero and delta, we don't actually know what delta is either. There just exists, exists some delta. So if you're close enough uh, to zero, and th then there's basically just some upper bound that's a quadratic. So that's, that's essentially what this means. So it means all the Taylor series extra terms are at most some constant c times this, at least when this is small enough, when w is close enough to w naught. Okay, so that's, that's the big O. So we'll, we'll be using the big O as this um, kind of gross approximation. Right. Any questions on, on the big O? Okay. So the way that we do our first order Taylor approximation, so the key point here is that this is an equality. There's, there's nothing, this is a, an exact description of this. Uh, of course, it's a rough one, but it's, it's an equality. So what we're going to do down here is we're going to make it an approximation, and we're going to do that by just omitting this term. And we know that this term is, you know, not that big. It's at, at most c times epsilon squared, where epsilon is itself a small number. So we're basically saying, like, this is not that big, so I can ignore it at least when this is small, and keep the other terms only. So here we would have j w naught plus d j d w evaluated at w naught times the deviation from the reference w minus w naught. Okay, and that is what is um, shown here. So we have J, again, is the blue one. This red line is going gonna, is gonna to be constructed exactly using this. Um, this is the linear part, and this is sort of like the intercept, if you will. This, this determines the intercept. <clears throat> okay. sometimes, we, sometimes we write the slope with a prime, like J prime, just conciseness. But this is, the, this is the idea if you have a scalar valued input. Um, I think this is something you guys have seen before probably many times in different math classes. All right. Um, but are there any questions on this? Because this is the main idea. The next thing to do is to extend this from scalar valued inputs to vector valued inputs, which is something you may or may not have seen before. Okay. So what do we do now? If j takes in a vector of d coefficients, so again we need a reference point. This is a this is reference point is itself a vector, and we'll call its values uh, w you know, w not one all the way to w not d. <clears throat> and so now the question is, well, how do we do this Taylor series um, in this vector case? So conceptually, it's the same. You measure the cost at the reference point. The only thing different now is instead of a single partial or a single derivative with respect to the input, we have a sum of partial derivatives with respect to all the different input terms. So we're summing over j, j indexes through, through these vectors. And we have um, Partial derivative evaluated at the reference, partial derivative with respect to wj, times the deviation between wj and its reference value. And then we have a big O term, which takes in the norm 
of the difference between W, the squared norm, difference between W and the reference. <clears throat> okay, so, so the only thing that really happened now is we have a sum because we have more than one coefficient. So in the previous slide, we just, we had one coefficient, so we had no sum. The only thing we're really saying is now just add the derivatives um, add, all, add a term for every one of the components in the vector. In fact, the same is true over here because this squared norm is just a sum of each element of this vector difference, right? So each of these guys were squaring and then summing across the different j's to make this. Okay, so that's, that's the main idea. Um, the rest is is just a little bit of linear algebra. Any questions on this idea? So we've gone from scalar to vector. <clears throat> okay, so the next thing we want to do is we just want to write this a bit more compactly so that it's something that we can, yeah, we can write it more compactly and we can code it more efficiently. So here we have a sum of, of two J a product of two J-dependent terms. We can notice that this is the jth entry of this vector difference, and we can notice that this is the jth entry of the gradient vector. And so that means we have a sum over, you know, jth entry of one vector times jth entry of another vector, which we can recognize as just the first vector transpose the second vector. <clears throat> okay, so we have something now much more compact, and this is all inequality. And so the very last step is to say, let's get rid of this. We'll have an approximately equal to as long as this is small enough, you know, for W near the reference. And so this is our first order approximation in the, in the vector case. Okay, any questions on this point here? Okay, so some of you now may remember from linear algebra that sometimes uh, we call this an inner product, or sometimes you call it a dot product, scalar product. Um, so the, the dot product is, is, exactly, is exactly this, what we're doing. The inner product, the dot product is like an example of the inner product, which is a more general idea. Um, the idea behind the inner product is, it holds for this as well, is if you have, um, <clears throat> okay, let me first explain maybe the dot product. So the dot product, uh, one way we can view this is it's a way of understanding the angle geometrically between two vectors. So if you have, in this case, we're looking at the gradient vector and we have some other vector, which is the difference vector. And you wanna know something about the angle between them, this tells you about that. So <clears throat> if you fix the lengths of these vectors, um, and as you make them more and more point in the same direction, this, this dot product will grow, it'll get bigger. The way to make this zero is to make the gradient orthogonal to this, meaning they would be at right angles to each other. And so that's, that's the idea behind the dot product or the inner product. The inner product allows you to generalize that idea um, beyond our dimension or d-dimensional real ve vectors to things that are more generic. So if you said, well, what if I have two matrices? Is there a way to compute the angle between two matrices to understand whether these matrices are pointing in the same direction or not? You might say, well, that sounds kind of crazy, but actually linear algebra is sort of a, is a generic, uh, it's a generic way of thinking about things that um, allows you to work not only with vectors of this form, but with generic objects called vectors that only have to obey a few simple things. You have to be able to add them together and you have to be able to scale them. Those, that's all you need to, to do sort of linear algebra. So for example, you can work with matrices. 
you can, you can make a linear algebra out of matrices where the, the, the elements in your vector space are matrices. You can do this with functions. So now you, the, the things you're, you're adding and scaling are functions. In all these cases, you might want to know what are the angle between these two functions. Are they pointing in the same direction or are they orthogonal? And all you have to do is define an appropriate inner product. So obviously this one would not work for functions because you know, functions are not of this form. For a function, in order to do the inner product, you'd need to define it with an integral. Same thing with matrices. Matrices don't have this form. So <clears throat> when we start talking about inner products, we have to say, OK, what is the vector space we're working on? That vector space has a particular inner product that is natural for that vector space. And if we're talking about real-valued finite dimensional vectors, then the inner product is you take the first, transpose it times the second. And the generic way that you might write this is you put angle brackets around the pair. So this is just sort of a notation, but um, angle bracket A comma B is just the inner product between A and B, which for the case of real valued vectors has that form. <clears throat> so what we'll see on the next page is when they're matrices, we have a completely different form. But we can still have the idea geometrically, intuitively, it's, it's the same, it's just the details change. So that's sort of just, uh, that's, that's what we're doing in this very last step, is we're going from this kind of mechanical dot product computation to more of an um, interpretation as some sort of angle between, between vectors in a, in a vector space. OK, so is that making sense? All right. <clears throat> OK, so. Let's pause for a moment now and, and reflect on, on what we're saying here and try to visualize things too. So <clears throat> this picture on the right, it's a pretty good visualization in the case of d equals 2. So we have along one dimension, we have w1. Along the other dimension, we have w2. And along the height, we have this function j of W. I guess that's, I'll put that here. Okay. So, and here is an illustration of the function, or at least a little piece of it. And you can see that we're, we're looking at a, a particular reference point, which is right there. This is W underline zero. Notice that the role of the underline plays is, is very particular, right? So here, there's no underline on, on the W. This is a scalar value. W1 means it's the first element in this vector. This W underline 0 does not mean the 0th element anywhere. That means this is an entire vector, and this is just how I'm calling the reference. This is the reference vector. Here is the generic vector W that you get from putting together those two things. So as you move around in this plane, you're changing the different Ws. And so therefore, when you look, the height of the function changes too, and that's your JW. Okay, so the use of the underlines is really important to keep things straight. If there's no underlines, things start to get really complicated. You don't know what scalars, what's vectors, what does a subscript even mean. Uh, you know, we're using subscripts in different ways, but it becomes clear when we put underlines on things. <clears throat> okay, so, okay, so the point of this slide is to say, we have said several times that when you look at the gradient of this function at this reference point, <clears throat> that it tells us both the direction of maximum increase of that function and slope. So in other words, if you're right here and you compute the gradient, you will get a, a vector you know, going in this direction from the origin or here or putting it over here. It's basically saying it's moving you in this direction. And that is because when you look at all the different directions you can travel in this plane, the one that most quickly increases the function is this direction. That is the one where the function increases most rapidly. It's a little bit hard to see here in, in three dimensions, but hopefully you understand what the picture is trying to show. Okay, so we're interested to see now, can we actually prove that? Can we prove that the gradient is in fact the direction that gives us the maximum increase? And then the second thing is, well, how, how, you know, how, is, how quickly is it increasing at that point? So here we have a little picture which is showing that, okay, if you move 
in that gradient direction a certain amount, this amount, then actually the function increases by this amount. So that's the slope, rise over run. So can we also show that the norm of the gradient is responsible for that slope? So that's our goal. Any questions on this, this uh, diagram? Okay, so if you understand the diagram, then I think the math will make more sense. Okay, so <clears throat> the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna use something called the directional derivative, which is just, let's take our reference point, let's define a direction vector u, and as a direction vector, it can be anything as long as it's a uh, norm of one, length of one. So it's saying, let's start at w0 and go epsilon in the direction of u, and then let's, let's look at how much the function has increased, so how much it has risen over how much we have traveled. So because u is norm one, we have traveled a distance of epsilon. Okay, so this is rise over run. So that's the directional derivative. Um, that should be telling us Exactly, it's like this this part here. How much, this is epsilon. This is how much we increased, and this is how much epsilon is. Okay, so also, you know, we're gonna use a very small epsilon, epsilon going to zero, but is everybody with me on what we're starting with? Directional derivative? Okay, so now we can use our Taylor series. So we want to use this equation up here but we want to do it where w is this thing, w naught plus epsilon u. So that is what I'm going to plug in here and here. Okay, so um, okay, let, me, let me write out um, what we have on the right side. So we're going to have, we have a fraction. In the numerator, we're going to have the gradient of j evaluated at w naught vector transpose times w naught plus epsilon times u minus w naught. This is because this is w here. And um, I'm going to add on. I'm going to add on the j w naught, but then I'm going to subtract it again. Okay. So, okay. So this this first thing is this. Okay. We're just using this equation here. So here you can see the j w naught is there. Uh, we have this term, the gradient transpose, and then w minus w naught. Here's our w minus w naught. Okay, so now we can start simplifying a few things. You can see that this cancels this. You can see that this cancels this. <clears throat> and, um, oh, and I forgot the denominator is just simply epsilon. <clears throat> And in fact, um, because this is all just linear up here, this epsilon, I can pull this out here, and then that will cancel this one in the denominator. So the epsilons also cancel. And so what that gives us, maybe I'll write it, um, this equals... So we have gradient times u, and that's it. Oh, sorry, uh, I, for, I forgot one important part. Sorry about this. Let me let me add the one important part, which is the the big O term. So the big O term is going to be okay. So to explain that, we have this big O term. But w is w naught plus epsilon u, so the w's cancel, and the big O term has inside it epsilon times u norm squared. Okay. <clears throat> All right.
right, so that is what this whole thing equals. Is everybody with me on how we got there? Okay, the, the thing we want to do now is look at what happens when epsilon goes to zero, where this is really going to become a derivative. So obviously the first term doesn't depend on epsilon, so that will stay. What about the second term? So notice we have an epsilon, but it is inside a squared norm. So if you pulled out this epsilon, you would actually square it. And so the numerator grows with epsilon squared, whereas the denominator grows with epsilon. So overall, this thing grows with epsilon. And as epsilon goes to 0, this whole thing disappears. <clears throat> so as a result, you get just j uh, omega naught, sorry, gradient j omega naught transpose u simple as that. <clears throat> okay, so that's certainly a very simple result, but it's not very intuitive. Not, we can't really learn much from it. So what we're going to do is we're going to make it a little bit more complicated by making it look like the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. So we're going to start with, we're going to multiply this norm of the gradient and then we're going to, on the right, take our inner product. And in the denominator, again, have that norm. And we're also going to multiply it times the norm of u, which we can do because the norm of u is just equal to 1. So I'll wait for you guys to catch up. Okay, so we have this cancels this. This is just 1. So that's how this is an equality. But now that we've written it this way, we can understand what's going on. So Cauchy-Schwartz says whenever you have something like this, this thing is going to be limited between 1 and minus 1, no matter what those vectors a and b are. And that, the way to maximize it, make it 1, is to make a and b point in the same direction. They don't have to be the same length, but they have to be pointing in exactly the same direction. So that tells us that, OK, if you want to maximize your gradient, you want to maximize this, and you want u to be pointing in exactly the same direction as the gradient. So. To maximize this directional derivative, we want to move u in the direction of the gradient. So basically, that tells us that, yes, moving in that direction is what takes you uphill the fastest. And furthermore, it's Cauchy-Schwartz says, well, if you do make them collinear, then that fraction turns into 1. So when this goes to 1, the directional derivative is just the norm of the gradient. OK, so finally, the norm of the gradient is the maximum slope of this function at point w naught, and it occurs in the direction of the gradient. So we have verified the things we set out to prove. <clears throat> okay, so this is just one way we can use this Taylor series stuff, but we'll use it several different ways as we move on. Okay, any questions on this? All right, sorry I, I went a little bit over time today. Um, 